Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, some things that I, I've been doing and, and one of the, the, the uh, kind of common thread among these things is, is the use of higher order structures. Um, so so there, there are some interesting relationships between the notion of graph representation learning, which is the, the idea of using uh, neural networks to, uh, on graphs to predict uh, properties of a graph uh, and uh, higher order graph structures. So what are these uh, higher order structures? Uh, you, I think there are many possible definitions. Uh, actually, I, there is a clear mathematical one that I'm not going to precisely give here, but, um, but essentially is any relationship that will go beyond uh, dyadic relationships. And dyadic relationships are uh, what we know as the common graphs where you have just uh, two entities in the relationship. Um, so even in the dyadic graph, if you look at more than two nodes, uh, for instance, here we have, um, let's see if you can see this. Uh, um, here we have the um, a, a, a induced subgraph, right, with four nodes. Uh, so that this uh, is a, a four, four area relationship in the graph. But it, and these are dyadic, so I still have edges, like the relationships are still described as, as pairwise. But you can also think of, say, hypergraphs uh, or simplicial uh, complexes where you have multiple relationships, like the edges are uh, among, say, three or four nodes. Uh, and, but these graphs are still, uh, can be described uh, imperfectly as dyadic graphs, uh, as you can see. It doesn't capture the data graph here. You see that the, this uh, three-way edge here, so an edge is this uh, triangle here. It doesn't, the data relationships don't perfectly capture the, the original data, right? So for instance, it could be that nine, 10, and six uh, had had a paper together, and this is a co-authorship uh, network. Um, it's actually a hyper edge, right? It's one paper relating three nodes, uh, but when you look at the dyadic relationships, you can only see uh, pairwise, which means maybe there's no, this, there are three papers and each paper is with two authors, right? So it's equivalent. And then therefore you lose some information in the process. So uh, this is the notion you have either induced subgraphs, which are, include uh, more than uh, two, two nodes, uh, three, four, five nodes, or you have hyper edges. Um, as a type of input. So the theme of this talk is representing a graph through its induced subgraphs. Actually, I'm not going to talk about hypergraphs. Uh, I'm focusing on, on dyadic graphs. But then we are going to look at um, uh, using subgraphs to extract a lot of useful information. So the first uh, uh, work that I want to talk about is learning high order uh, higher order representations from uh, dyadic relationships. So imagine you have this, uh, this network, okay? Um, these are, are no the nodes are players in this um, multiplayer uh, environment uh, where there are online games. And, uh, and, and we are seeing whether or not they played with someone else in the same game. But uh, so, so if, but you can play with multiple players. For instance, these five players here, they probably play together, right? In the same game. And now we have this, all these edges uh, between the nodes, but actually it's, it's effectively a hyper edge, but it's re recorded in the data set as a, as a set of edges. So can we learn this kind of hyper edge representations? Meaning uh, I, I am, looking for a way to express uh, five nodes, four node representations of these hyper edges, just looking at the dyadic data, right? So I don't have this hyper edge uh, data. So the, the, the important thing here is to understand how actually uh, unsupervised learning on graphs actually work, especially with dyadic graphs. So 
the way that they, they, they work, essentially, if you go look at the papers, and you, the first thing I do is I look at the, the, the loss function that, the, that the, uh, the method is proposing. And if the loss function is over edges, and it's a sum over edges, it effectively means that they are considering edges to be conditionally independent. So what does that mean? Is that, uh, so all the deep learning models on graphs are probabilistic models, okay? Um, so, so essentially what it means is that the probability of this graph that you see, it, given the parameters of the model, which are, would be the, the, neural, the neural weights of your neural network, um, is, is described as the, the product of the probability over the edges. So good, given the model, the, pro, the edges, the probability that you have edges in the graph are all independent, okay? So this conditional independence given a model creates this, uh, uh, this, this structure. And then uh, if you do the log likelihood of this, you get the sum over the edges and that's what you see in all the loss functions that of unsupervised learning for graphs. Okay, so, so these are uh, uh, dyadic graph methods and they look at essentially pairwise relationships. So what they are really trying to do is to predict a bunch of uh, conditionally independent pairwise relationships. Now, if you think about, okay, so now let's do a neural network that instead of trying to just uh, talk about two nodes, it's, it's trying to predict more than two. It's trying to predict three nodes, four nodes, what uh, build a model on this higher order structure. But the problem is that if you do this naively, it won't work, right? Because before we had this uh, conditional independence and it works for, for dyadic relationships. But that conditional independence no longer works if you are talking about a larger subgraphs, right? So for instance, you, you look here, we have this, uh, this four nodes, okay? That we created, oh, there's no link here, sorry. Uh, that we created uh, from this graph. Uh, so this subgraph here, if you try to describe the probability of observing this graph, okay? Um, uh, break, broken down into subgraphs, it's, it's a wrong probability because uh, the probability that this subgraph is like this uh, is not independent of, conditionally independent on the subgraph being like this because they share edges, right? They share this edge, they share this edge here, and they share this edge. So there is no way uh, uh, where the probability uh, of a subgraph that has uh, some shared edges with another one can be independent, right? Even conditionally independent. So, so because of this, uh, this uh, there's no way, simple way to, to do this uh, probabilistic model, uh, unlike what we did with the attic relationship where there's no sharing of edges by definition. So you can just uh, easily do this, right? But here, conditional independence doesn't work. So we have to change the way that we model the graphs. And the way that, uh, uh, one way that we propose to do this is to uh, talk about the probability of this graph. So it's a statistical model of a graph, given the parameters of the model, uh, the neural weights, as uh, essentially a uh, energy-based model, okay? So, so the way this works is as follows. We have this, uh, 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 kind of um, energy uh, function. So it gives you the energy of this graph. And then this phi energy function is actually a sum over energy of all the subgraphs that you have. And the Z here is the partition function, essentially is the sum over all possible uh, configurations of this, uh, that this graph can have, okay? Um, so, so it will be a sum over all possible graphs of this size, for instance. Now, this uh, creates a uh, this creates a probability distribution, right, uh, uh, for for the graphs, and then it allows us to uh, to then model higher order structures. Uh, so, so that this this phi, for instance, of this subgraph here. Is can be a GNN, a graph neural network. So the graph neural network will output a representation for the subgraph, and and that's what we are going to use uh, an energy function. Okay, so so 
um, there are a lot of details that I'm not going to discuss, uh, especially like how do you get this partition function is a very hard task. Um, I'm just, it's not a talk about this specific paper, but just giving an idea of where we can use this higher order structures uh, to, to build models that are not just uh, node embeddings, right? Not about uh, just pairwise relationships. They are about higher order relationships. Um, and then the method uh, as a whole, as I said, I'm not going to talk much about it, uh, is, is essentially uh, an energy-based function um, of the subgraphs that, that sums over all the subgraphs in the graph. And of course, this is very computationally intensive, so we have to do some uh, sampling. And we have a way to do a finite unbiased uh, MCM sampling for subgraphs. And with this, we get uh, a proper uh, um, objective for our uh, optimization, uh, essentially an upper bound on the loss. So, so and this allows us also the partition function is estimated with contrastive uh, noise contrastive estimation. So, so we, putting this together, we can we get a, a, a decent optimization objective for this. So essentially, we can learn this higher order representations from dyadic graphs. And then uh, the task that we used in this work was uh, something simple. Uh, say we have uh, actually hyper edges in, in, uh, in some, some, uh, some hyper edges, but not many uh, in some data set, but it's a data set of dyadic relationships. So can we learn in a non-supervised fashion uh, the, the higher order representations? Uh, Say four node representations of the graph, and then use uh, the few hid hidden hyper edges, uh, like a few shot learning procedure, uh, to, to then uh, train a simple classifier on top of this to predict whether the hyper edge exists or not. And, and of course, so the existing methods are not designed for this task, so they don't essentially work. Uh, for this task. And, and even if you try other types of methods, uh, like uh, um, uh, KGNMs, they, they are too computationally expensive for this, and also they are not designed for this type of task. So they, they, in, the, in the end, they can't work for this task either. So essentially, we got uh, uh, around this, all these challenges by having this uh, sub induced subgraph representations uh, using an energy-based model, okay? So, so this is one uh, possible thing, it's kind of trying to, uh, a supervised learning of these hidden high order structures. Uh, was original, has original uh, graph uh, a hypergraph? Is the original graph a hypergraph? Um, yeah, so, so the, the data that we got when we were learning the representation was dyadic. Um, and what we did is we looked at the nodes and went back into the actual original data um, or original records. And, and, and either we, we, uh, we, we manually decided that this was a hyper edge or we would, um, or there was some information there that, we, that the hyper edge existed but was not used in the data set. Um, so with this very few hyper edges, uh, then we, because we are doing supervised learning, we, we, we can train the model in the dyadic network and then, and then go uh, and learn with say 10 or 20 or 100 uh, hyper edges is enough for us to learn a simple classifier uh, uh, in unsupervised fashion, in the supervised fashion and then, and then predict the hyper edges. So the, the original networks are, are, have hyper edges, but we have very few of them. So we cannot learn as a hyper edge network if that makes sense. Okay, so the, the other one that I'm, I'm particularly uh, excited about um, is, is this idea of uh, counterfactually invariant um, representations, specifically bringing uh, some kind of robustness uh, to uh, changes uh, based on, on uh, on changing changing some uh, uh, confounders in your in your uh, in your data, so that you're robust. Uh, so a lot of uh, interesting work has been going on in 
uh, counterfactually invariant representations, and we have defined us. Uh, we have done a, a bunch of work in my lab and on this, uh, defining what it is and how that relates to auto distribution generalization. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about uh, one very interesting case where we are doing this for graphs and graph sizes. So uh, one interesting thing about uh, graph neural networks is that um, say that you have a task here, uh, say you have an fMRI, and you want to build a, a, a connectome, right? A network um, uh, of connections in the brain. Um, and then you have this connectome and then you say you pass a, a graph neural network or some whatever graph method you want. And then you have some graph representation, right? Some vector that represents that uh, uh, graph. And now we have uh, this row, which is a downstream classifier uh, predicting the property of this graph, say the person is schizophrenic or has some problem. Um, so it's a property of the graph that you're trying to predict with this graph representation. Uh, so this is a graph classification task. Given a graph, I have a label. Um, what's interesting about this is that uh, our current approach to this task is, is like this. We have these graphs and we have these labels. And uh, the way that we train our methods, essentially we get all this data, we shuffle them, and then we split uh, generally, uh, most cases, uh, in train and test. So effectively the train and the test distribution of graphs and labels is essentially the same, right? Um, so that, that the train distribution is the same as the test distribution. Uh, so the question is then, what if the test data were out of distribution, meaning the test data has some uh, a difference between the, the train data. Uh, um, it's not that different examples. There, there is something uh, fundamentally different about the test. So the first question that we, we asked, and, and the idea of extrapolation here, I think is, um, uh, I think folks sometimes get things a bit uh, um, confused about what extrapolation really is. So in, in neural networks or deep learning, extrapolation is not really a geometric concept because it, in my, my view, it doesn't make sense to talk about it geometrically. Uh, if you have a linear model, yes, right? In linear algebra, it, it, you can talk about uh, convex holes and et cetera. But in, in, in deep learning, uh, because of the uh, arbitrary mapping and the fact that these functions are, can be universal approximators, uh, it doesn't really make sense to talk about uh, what is inside some space or what's outside and what's extrapolation. Uh, th those notions geometrically are not really solid and, and, and we can talk about that uh, later. Um, but but the, the real, so what advocate, the way that I advocate about extrapolation is using causality. Like you need to understand extrapolation through causality. So, so, uh, so uh, I'll give you an example. So GNNs can be applied to graphs of any size, right? You, you, you are a graph neural network. You can, uh, uh, you can I give you, I you train on a small graph and they can just apply that to a larger graph. The actual algorithm works, right? It, it will spit out some result. Uh, so if you did graph classification on a small graph, it will spit out a result for the large graph. But that doesn't mean that it works, you see? Um, the fact that it, the algorithm can run doesn't mean that's going to be good. Um, so so let, let's do this, this simple task, right? So if we're actually learning something about the graph, think about a graph neural network really learning something about like whether the graph has some property, right? The brain, this, this connectome is from a schizophrenic person or not, right? So you would, if it really learns something, right? Then if you, if, you, if you decide to make your connectome have say uh, 500 nodes, okay? You build your graph with, from the fMRI with 500 uh, boxes. Uh, then uh, if you decide later to say, oh, I have a high resolution scans, I, I can do now a thousand or 10,000 or whatever number you want to do. Uh, I, then it, the method should still work, right? It, fundamentally, you, you train on 100, but it's the same type of structure, right, that you're looking at. You just kind of refined it a bit more. Um, so, so, so that method is, 
supposed to kind of work, right? If you go from 100 to 150, at least, like maybe 100 to 1,000, maybe it's too much, but 100 to 150 should work, right? Um, uh, like you train on 100 and then you test on, on 150 and, and you would expect this thing works, but actually it doesn't. Um, so if, if, if you train on small graphs, okay, and then I give, I give fMRIs and, and connectomes of the same size that I trained, uh, the performance is what we see in blue, okay? That's the accuracy of our schizophrenia prediction. But now if I, if I train on this 100 uh, size graphs and then, and then I decide in my test to have, to have 150 nodes instead of just 100, uh, now the performance is a lot worse, right? Uh, it's the, the green one. And that's what we call auto distribution because in training, the distribution, the size distribution of your graphs is one and in test is different, is larger. It also works the other way around. When you have, you train on large graphs and then you go to small graphs, it also doesn't work. And these are many, uh, so in the y-axis, we have many different types of uh, neural networks and we have many different types of aggregators. Even the mean, uh, people would say, oh, well, what about the mean aggregator for a graph neural network? That should be kind of a size invariant to the neighborhood. It's not. So uh, there is a big discrepancy between distribution and auto distribution. So how do we extrapolate beyond the training distribution, right? So, uh, if auto distribution examples are available, there are data driven methods that work. So you can do domain adaptation, covariate shift adaptation, few shot learning, data augmentation, and invariant risk minimization. There are many, many methods that work if you have graphs that are larger, right, than your training, or if your graphs in training are large, then you have small graphs in test, right? You have some examples. Maybe you don't even have the labels, it's okay, uh, but you see at least the larger graphs, right? Although if you don't have the labels, um, there is some recent work and something that we actually knew for a long time. Uh, it doesn't really, like the, the domain adaptation methods like covariate shift adaptation don't really, they're not really supposed to work. Uh, they work mostly uh, because of an, uh, an assumption of how things work, but it, it, it's not guaranteed that they work for you, okay? so. So these are like, if you're given, if you see examples of larger graphs, then you can use data-driven methods. So what's the pro is that you can use existing GNN methods, right? Uh, you don't assume a mechanism for how the distribution shifts between training and test. Uh, the, the, the advantage of this data-driven method is that you must have examples of the graph. And that's difficult in some cases, right? Uh, you, would, you would like your, classifier, your method should be robust to the number of nodes, right? If it's a little slightly larger, it should still work. Um, you don't have to see examples of a slightly larger graph to make sure that your method works. Um, so, so here we assume, okay, so let's think that there is no access to this auto distribution data. Uh, so that requires actually a causal mechanism. So you need to understand how graphs grow what is the property that is preserved when they grow? And I think that's a very interesting uh, uh, point of view. If you're thinking about say network science, right? Uh, which has uh, for years now studied how graphs grow, right? Uh, as a, among many other things, the mechanism behind the graphs. And, and, and I feel that this field has a, a, a lot to contribute to, to our quest of auto distribution robustness in graph neural networks, because it's exactly what we are after when we are talking about the causal mechanism. So let me uh, explain a little bit the, uh, uh, the difference between observational tasks, which is the task that you see in 99% of the ML papers today, uh, that you, vast majority of the triple AI papers are uh, about observational, especially the graph ones. Um, and causal or counterfactual modeling, okay? So an, an observational task is one where um, you, you are predicting and seeing uh, examples of the training distribution. So, so it's in, your test data has the same distribution of sizes and properties as the training, all right? Um, 
so that there is no there are no surprises uh, when like the only thing is that you see new examples, but there are no surprises about the, the distribution itself, the mechanism behind it. You are essentially learning correlations between the input and the output, okay? Uh, relationships, which are associations, right? Um, so so let me show you like a, a, a kind of a, a physics ex, uh, equivalence that uh, that I, I I thought about that I like a lot. So you see, if you're trying to predict the orbit of a planet, right, you can just observe it in the sky and then come up with a model, okay, for that and, and predict uh, the, the, the next orbit. So, so for instance, you can, you can have this type of uh, uh, mechanics, right, of, uh, of orbit um, like Kepler did, uh, or you can use epicycles, right, uh, uh, to, to predict the orbit of a planet. And for epicycles, like sometimes the, the, the planet will do a retrograde motion and move forward. But, but if you make your epicycle uh, model good, right? So th here's a sun, here is uh, Mars. And then you can see that uh, with Kepler's model is better, right? It's easier to predict, but epicycles also work. You can make a complex model and you can predict where Mars is going to be fine. You, you don't need, this model is absolutely correct if you're just trying to predict where Mars is going to be in 10 years, okay? It's fine, it doesn't matter. It works, it's, a, it's an associational task. Mars is doing this now, where is it gonna be? Well, it's gonna be in that position in 10 years, fine. Um, but a counterfactual task is very different. A counterfactual task, if you train on small graphs and then you test on larger graphs, you 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 are essentially asking what would be what would be the property of this graph as it grows? What is some kind of conserved conserved property as it grows? And what would be the label of this new type of graph uh, it, when it's larger? It's a, it's a little bit like Newton's laws, right? If you are asking, you haven't seen how um, you haven't seen examples of larger graphs, and then you are asking a property, right? How do graphs with this type of label grow? Uh, it, it, you're, you're asking a question about the mechanism that makes them grow, okay? And it's a little bit about Newton's laws in terms of, uh, if you think about the uh, motion of planets. Uh, now, if you intervene on a planet, right? If you push Mars a little bit farther or push it inside, uh, um, closer to Earth, you now know how to compute what would be the next uh, orbit of Mars, right? Uh, while if you have epicycles, right, you just know, you just, you're just a passive observer. You're just observing what is there. You, you cannot uh, wonder what would happen if you change something, you see? Uh, but it still works as an associational model, right? Epicycles are totally fine. Um, but Newton's model is, predicts what happens uh, if, you, if you want to change something, you see, that you haven't seen. So, um, so the remainder of the talk, the, 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 this part of the talk, uh, uh, given a label, what would be the graph and if, like if it were larger? And actually, the, the first question we asked ourselves was, okay, so what if given a label, what would be the graph like if the graph decided to grow to infinity? Okay, um, and 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 then when. Uh, um, one class of graphs that we know a lot about uh, as they grow is uh, this, this uh, graph uh, models uh, known as the graph forms, okay? Uh, and, and, and so Lazo Lova has published a, a set of papers, actually has a book um, on this uh, uh, notion of graph limits. So what's the invariant property? What doesn't change in a graph fundamentally uh, as it becomes larger? And then he talks about essentially all uh, uh, um, statistical graph models of dense graphs. Uh, so it showed, showed that the density of induced subgraphs of a dense random graph converges as uh, uh, the size of the graph goes to infinity. So essentially, uh, what's the density of induced subgraphs? We have this graph here on the left, okay? Uh, it could be trained or test graph. And then we have, we are counting uh, how many of this uh, colored subgraphs here we have on the structure. Okay, so we have one and we found two. So there are two of those 
So, so what they show is that for any kind of a dense random graph model, uh, then this, this frequency of the subgraphs converges, okay, as n grows. So if it, for the same type of graph on same type of model, if you decide, if you ask it to grow, the frequency of subgraphs remains the same. We, we converge to some value, okay? It doesn't remain the same, it converges to some value. So in this case, for instance, the frequency of this type of subgraph over all possible uh, case size into subgraphs or four size into subgraphs would be this. Um, so we have another subgraph here for size uh, with four nodes, and then the, the, it has another density. And what happens is that if you use this, if this was created by a, uh, a random graph, right, a dense random graph, then as it grows, this these relative frequencies will converge. So the, the question then is, uh, okay, so if suppose our data is like this, then how do we construct a graph representation from subgraph densities, right? That, uh, so that the, the representation of the graph remains the same uh, if the graph decides to grow. And, and also in the paper, we show that this is a counterfactual invariant representation that or approximately invariant representation, meaning if you if you force the graph to grow, then uh, this representation is uh, is going to be bounded, uh, meaning that the feature vector you get from this graph is, has a bound with respect to the size of the graph and the size of the subgraphs that you are building building your, your um, uh, representation from. So the idea then is to use this induced subgraph densities. And then instead of uh, representing the, the entire graph of a GNN, we just represented subgraphs with a GNN. So now we have a subgraph representation, which is this readout in GNN uh, for, for each of the subgraphs. So for instance, we have a representation for this graph, and then we sum over multiplying them by the frequency that they appear. So there is a weight on each representation by how often it appears on the graph. Um, so, and if you now compare, for instance, the schizophrenia task, we have all these other GNN models with different types of pooling, and you can see that in distribution and out of distribution, they have different performances. While this type of representation is just stable, like it, it has the same accuracy uh, in distribution and out of distribution. And when I say, when I say in distribution, I don't mean uh, the test data, okay? We are not looking at the training data, right? It's not accuracy on training and accuracy on tests. It's not that. It's that the test has the same distribution as the, the training, right? Uh, and, and here, when you make a counterfactual invariant representation, you get the property that the, the, the accuracy in the, in the in distribution test data is the same as the out of distribution test data, which is, means that your method now is robust. Okay, so um, I'm not going to go over the theory much. Um, uh, there is a notion of, we use the, the notion of most expressive representations to explain how this works. Uh, we have a theorem uh, showing uh, how these representations are approximately size invariant. Um, we have a bound essentially on, on how much the representation changes. And that, uh, that's a function of K and the size of the graph. So, so if you're trying to make larger uh, induced subgraph represent, uh, your graph representation with larger induced subgraph representations, then uh, you need larger graphs because uh, um, otherwise the frequencies are going to be, uh, you're not going to have a good estimate of the frequencies of those larger subgraphs inside the graph. Um, so, so that's um, uh, essentially the, the proof relies on uh, low vast graph limits and you can find in the paper. Um, and then we also have uh, what's the effect of invariant representations. Um, uh, essentially uh, that it, we can show that if you have a counterfactual invariant representation with respect to sizes, then, uh, then your train and test generalization are the same. Actually the proof doesn't, just talk about sizes, it talks about any counterfactual invariant representation of a graph, uh, your in distribution generalization error and your out of distribution generalization error should be the same, uh, have the same bounds. Um, so essentially, uh, in distribution, what, you know that you have something that's counterfactual invariant 
is likely to be a counterfactual invariant if its outer distribution and in distribution errors are the same, which is the case. So uh, given, uh, let's think about another sim simple example, right? That was an actual data set with schizophrenia task, but you can think of Erdos Rainier task where you're trying to predict uh, the, 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 the connection probability, the density of the graph. Uh, I have a question. What's the assumption the graph that needs to hold for uh, n to infinity to hold? That's a good question. So um, that requires uh, that uh, essentially uses the Aldous Hoover theorem on uh, infinite exchangeability. Uh, so the the formal conditions is 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 uh, essentially that uh, the, the the probability distribution of the graph must be described as a um, uh, a mixture of uh, independent probabilities over the edges. So, so that if you have a mixture model over the edges, uh, that's the Aldous Hoover theorem. Uh, in practice, I can tell you that um, what, what happens here is, is that you see, like a statistical model of a graph has a following problem. As the graph grows, it has to remember relationships that are extremely far away, right? Think, think about the probability distribution as a sequence of edges. So if an edge does something, it has to know what an edge infinitely far away is doing, right, uh, to, to, to build a graph. But, but that's not possible in a statistical model of a graph. Like you can't have these infinite correlations. So, so what happens then is that to have a proper statistical model, you would have to break it down into uh, a mixture model, like, uh, which is, uh, uh, you, you have some kind of um, uh, mixture of, uh, of say, parameter of theta, and then given theta, things are conditionally independent. So that's what the Elder Hoover theorem proves. And this is the condition for it, for this to hold. Um, there are other models. Uh, 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 Emily Fox has an interesting uh, paper on Kallenberg exchangeability, which is a different type of exchangeability than we generally use uh, for, for graphs. Um, and, and her model is, is a, has a little a bit more flexibility, but still it's, it's a, a mixture, a mixture model. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. That's a very good question. Um, not all graphs can do this. Uh, so in practice, I expect this type of work to, to look like uh, uh, we will start talking about maximum sizes and finite graphs. So. Uh, because infinite graphs is, really limits the kind of models that you can build. Um, so for Erdos Rainey, uh, we have that uh, these counterfactual invariant representations work perfectly as you would expect because it's an easy task, but you can see that the original GNNs suffer a lot. They have a lot of trouble. In distribution, they predict perfectly what the probability of the edge is, but once you make the graph grow or shrink, they, they get lost, right? They don't know what they're saying anymore. Some, also, some of them are even uh, predict close to random. Um, so so uh, a quick note on invariant risk minimization, if you're familiar with this, there are really no guarantees if the representation is nonlinear, it's not applicable if training graphs have the same size. Um, um, it's not invariant to auto distribution support, which is different than training. And everything I talked about, the support of the, uh, the sizes that you see in training and, and tests are totally different. Um, the, the, training si the training graphs could have all the same size. So, so invariant risk minimization, I feel for graph representation learning is not really the ideal uh, type of procedure. Not only invariant risk minimization, but all the, the follow-up work on that direction because they, they, they are very limiting on what they can do. Um, and we tried actually, and it doesn't work. Um, so we tried to use all these methods. Uh, it doesn't work. You actually have to understand a mechanism behind the graph. It's, there is no way around that. Um, um, just to show how IRM doesn't work. So if you try to apply, uh, which is essentially a, a type of data-driven method, you really need the, the causal model, which is how graphs actually grow to be able to do this. So, so um, I'm not going to go over the structural causal model uh, on this. Uh, you can look at the paper, um, but um, 
there is also like a, something about using uh, vertex attributes because GNNs are able to do that. And you can also extrapolate even if the graph has labels, has uh, uh, node attributes. Edge attributes would also work. Uh, the other thing that I want to say is that uh, this representation is not universal because if a graph has a different mechanism to grow than, than this uh, graph form mechanism, then it needs a specific mechanism designed for that task. So if you apply this in another task, even our representation is not going to do well because it's not invariant for all kinds of graphs. You see, a causal graph is interesting because in network science, every graph has a graph and there may be universal mechanism between a few graphs, right? Um, but, but it's for those graphs, it's not something that you can just apply to your data set. You, can actually, you need to actually understand how your graph works. Okay, and, and, and finally, uh, I want to quickly go over uh, the idea of reconstruction for more powerful graph representations. Uh, it's an interesting uh, work uh, where the current trend, what we want to do is graph representation for say supervised graph classification. Uh, the current trend is uh, message passing graph neural network. There are many other alternatives, but a lot of them actually you can describe as a message passing graph neural network. Um, the challenge is to increase both expressive power theoretically and generalization in practice, right? You can actually generalize better. Um, so how many uh, pairs of non-isomorphic graphs can be distinguished by a graph neural network is what is known as its expressive power. So we want to have that uh, a GNN that can distinguish many different non-isomorphic graphs, but at the same time generalize as well, which is generally the challenge. Uh, so I won't go over exactly how this works, but if you're familiar with uh, graph neural networks, you may have seen uh, lots of papers on, on how they are not expressive enough and, and how they relate to the uh, Westphalia Lehman one uh, algorithm, uh, which is a type of a graph um, isomorphism test. Um, but if the graph has a lot of symmetries, then gra graph neural networks don't work as well. So for instance, this two, for these two graphs here, uh, essentially a graph neural network, a standard uh, graph neural network is going to give you the same representation for the graphs. So you cannot distinguish the two graphs. Um, and, and, and existing high order models that ex extend expressiveness to match the KL, uh, K, uh, WL test, which uses like high order um, structures are very expensive to compute. Um, and, and then it's, it's really hard, like they're not quite used in practice. Uh, so what we, we decide to do is to look at um, uh, graph theory and, and uh, specifically the graph reconstruction conjecture. Uh, so if the graph reconstruction conjecture is true, then if you look at the graph, it can be defined by its subgraphs, okay? Um, at, up to a certain size. Um, so for instance, here I have the set of subgraphs uh, of uh, with where one node is removed from the graph. And the conjecture states that these subgraphs uniquely determine this graph, okay? Uh, it's not true for directed graphs, but we, we don't need ever to talk about directed graphs in most cases. Um, and uh, because we can talk about edge proper edge attributes, we can always encode directions that edge attributes. Um, and then, um, and then this is a multiset, right? Because we can have uh, equivalent repeated values. So in this multiset represents this graph uniquely. Okay. So, so, so since the if the graph re, re, uh, reconstruction conjecture is true, then uh, 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 representing this graph through its subgraphs uh, does not lose any information. Therefore, we can. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that if I start looking at subgraphs of these very symmetric graphs, uh, you can see that the subgraphs are very different. And then now a, G, a graph neural network can distinguish them. So while they could, a graph neural network may not be able to distinguish the two original graphs, it's able to distinguish their uh, uh, multi-set of subgraphs, you see? Um, the multi-sets are different. Um, and then we can achieve like a, very good generalization here, not only in practical tasks, uh, but also in the, the kind of uh, theoretical ones where graph neural networks are pretty bad. You can see that the accuracy is very low. Uh, this type of uh, reconstruction 
based um, uh, graph representation works extremely well. Um, and then in all tasks we tried, uh, it, it tends to improve. Uh, and we know, for instance, that if you look at subgraphs of half of the size of the graph, then the reconstruction conjecture is known not, is known not to be true. So, so we also tested that and we saw that really like at that point, it's not, uh, it's not useful anymore. You really have more information at you know, by removing fewer nodes. Uh, Professor Ribeiro, uh, just a minute. So, uh, so we may run out of time. Uh, oh yeah, I'm, I'm not about to end. Uh, so, so there are other approaches. There is actually okay. a generalization. And then what I wanted to say is, I think higher order networks are uh, very interesting for graph representation learning. Uh, higher order allows us to pertain or add data graphs to predict hyper edges. We add related to content factor invariant learning uh, uh, in graphs. I think uh, uh, higher order structures and especially network science will have play a big role on bringing causality to graph representation learning. And they also can improve uh, the expressiveness of message pass in GNNs. And, and they kind of bring many different areas together, which, which I, I, I like. Actually, I should put the network science here because it's also part of that. Uh, thank you, I'm open for questions. Oh, uh, the question, what's the complexity of the subgraph representation? Yeah, so uh, it's essentially the same as the, gra the original graph. We don't have, uh, the subgraphs are quite large. But the, the, the way that we do this, we do this uh, with um, uh, Monte Carlo sampling. So, so essentially the question is, how do we build a set, this set representation? And, uh, and we can estimate this uh, uh, representation uh, by sampling. And you can also be smart about which subgraphs you need to construct to do this. Um, uh, for instance, you can, you can remove uh, just, a spe just some special kind of nodes, say the K core, or, or you see, like if you, if you remove some type of nodes based on the structure of the graph, then uh, that's enough to build a, uh, a set that doesn't have a lot of elements on it. So, so this, is, this is actually quite doable. It's not uh, out of reach. That's a very good question. Okay. Um, okay.